Hello, thanks for joining us. Um, so we're going to start off with an interview with Amy Pope, who has not started her new job, but in the uh, 1st of October, she will be the new Director General of the International Organization for Migration. So i um, happy to get this started. We have a pretty short um, exchange for like 10 minutes, so why don't we jump right into it? Have a seat. Where's our fire? Aren't we supposed to have a fire side? Oh, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, all right, so let me get this. Um, okay, so you have just come off uh, of a very rough and tumble political campaign, something you don't really see in the UN world very much. Um, and you're starting up very quickly. You're going to have a very big um, role and responsibility coming up. In one of your campaign sort of you know, I wouldn't say complaints, but concerns was that, um, you know, IOM has a pretty large budget of about $3 billion, but the vast majority of that is not discretionary funding. You don't get to decide how to spend that money. It's contributions from member states, and they tell you what they wanted to spend it on it. And so I think you had concerns about um, the constraints of that place on having a more strategic approach to determining how um, IOM did its job. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, and um, first of all, thank you for having me and thanks for the great work that you do um, in, in educating the public about the work we do and, and our partners in the humanitarian space. So when I when I decided to run for um, the head of the International Organization for Migration, I did so because um, personally, aside from where the US government is, um, I personally believe there is much more that we can do as an organization to anticipate and respond to the displacement pressures that we're seeing around the world. And I'll just take an obvious one that we're all talking about right now, climate change, right? We know that climate is displacing people already in very significant numbers. Just two weeks ago, I was in northern Kenya at Dadaab, where we saw 100,000 people cross the border from Somalia because of the drought. Now, drought is one of those things where we should be able to anticipate and work with communities to respond well before you have 3 million people who are on the road um, with nothing um, except for their the clothes they're wearing on their backs. But really the international community did almost nothing to respond after drought season one, drought season two, drought season three, drought season four, lo and behold, drought season five, a million people are on the move and we then spend hundreds of millions of dollars in response. So my view is that the better, smarter way to ensure that we are putting our money to good use and saving more lives is to be able to anticipate and respond well before communities are displaced en masse. That's what I'd like to do with IOM. That does mean uh, putting some money and resources into that prevention, into that data analysis. And people don't love to fund prevention, right? right? The money comes when the disasters happen. But unfortunately, that means the money comes after lots of lives have been lost. Right. If you talk to any head of any UN agency over the last five years, including your predecessor, uh, your soon-to-be predecessor, um, they would say that they have been focused on um, preventive action, that they have been focusing on um, trying to anticipate the impact of climate change. I mean, they've all been talking about these issues. So at IOM, I mean, what was it that you weren't doing? Like, how would it be different? I mean, if there is an example of somewhere where you think you could have been more proactive and you weren't. So right now, IOM has tended to work mission by mission, country office by country office. That means that we might have incredible innovations in a place like Colombia or in Costa Rica, but our mission in Bangladesh has no idea what has happened and what has worked, right? Now, some of that is a function of each office having to fundraise and make its own case for, for its resources, but some of it we at the headquarters level can do more to make sure that people understand what the best practices are and how to find them and use them and adapt them to the communities we serve. Now, some of this means embracing um, technology in ways that we haven't. You know, I walked into IOM and I, I came from the US government and those of you who've worked in the US government will know that our computer systems are not cutting edge. 
<laughs> IOM was basically in 1996, right? It was like, you know, the little, right. you know, little beeping dots, right, that show up, right? We, we need to be using the innovative tools that technology has already uh, created, but, but we don't. So that's where we start. Right. So um, let me take you back to something else you said on the campaign. You were quite critical of your predecessor about the lack of um, sort of travel to the Southern uh, Hemisphere in the Americas. And, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit. I mean, you were backed by the U.S. government. Um, you know, uh, migration is a very big, s sensitive political issue in the United States. Um, how much of a priority is this going to be? What are you going to be doing differently than you did before? And sort of how do you kind of manage sort of your role as a UN and kind of try to sort of step aside away from the American kind of culture wars, um, which can be quite dangerous Toxic, for anybody, yes. yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned my first priority is climate and climate impact on displacement. My two other priorities speak to this. Um, number two is building more regular pathways for migration. Number three is partnering with the private sector and others to create a more uh, an ecosystem where people can have better migration outcomes. So that means if you look in Latin America right now, we are seeing historic numbers of people crossing the Americas. And this isn't a U.S. southern border problem. Yes, the U.S. does have a problem on its southern border, but it is impacting communities in the southern, I mean, in, this, in the south of South America, as well as across Central America, all the way through Mexico. But the major issue and the major failure of our international system at this moment in time is that we have built a system to respond to the needs of refugees, meaning that people who are displaced as a result of persecution because they belong to a certain social group or their nationality. The international system does not yet have in place ways of protecting and providing alternatives to people who are displaced by extreme poverty, for example, or people who are displaced by climate disaster. So my view is that if we're really going to be able to respond to some of the most pressing issues of our day, we need to build systems where people who cannot survive or find a job at home, who cannot feed their, their children, um, to, to be able to find an alternative. And that to me is what's exciting about working in Latin America because there's tremendous potential. And then you layer on the demographic changes between, um, especially across the Southern Hemisphere and, then, and the aging populations in the North. And it quickly becomes apparent that migration is going to be an important tool in order to continue innovation, development, um, to continue to see economies run. So for me, this is about building pathways that enable continued innovation, development, and outcomes that work for the migrants themselves, yes, the communities they come from, and the communities they're going to. Right, and trying to manage, manage sort of the potential political outcome, which is often more extremist, anti- uh, sort of migrant governments, right? Which we're seeing. Absolutely. Europe, and right? I hear the same thing um, from colleagues in Europe. When they see people on a boat coming across the Mediterranean, it fuels a very polarized debate. When a person comes for a job on an airplane, goes, you know, is contributing to the economy, contributing to innovation and development, there's no peep. People are grateful and excited about the capacity of that person. Right. So my goal is to make sure we enable those better outcomes as much as possible. Right. I want to make sure I, I got to another topic to Somalia before um, you left. But um, we did a piece earlier in the week about a fairly widespread and systematic um, aid theft um, crisis in Somalia, um, the IDPs uh, fleeing their homes during the drought. Um, are sort of uh, going to settling in camps around some of the ma major cities, and they're finding that they have to pay up to 20, 25 percent of their aid in order to get access to uh, food and other supplies from the international community. So, you know, are we sort of at, at a point where the UN agencies are just not able to manage these funds responsibly? Or, you know, is it a situation where we just have to accept the fact that in some of these conflict zones that a certain level of corruption is um, justifiable 
and there's no alternative to it because the alternative is mass loss of life. So I think there's a, a option C, um, not surprisingly. Um, one, we we have to set high expectations and we have to have the systems in place to avoid the diversion of resources. That means for us, it means putting biometric controls in place. It means working with our sister agencies, for example, the World Food Program, so that we're deduplicating and making sure that people are not um, applying multiple times with one identity. It means um, working with communities to provide land, because one of the issues in Somalia is that people were moving into private land and the private landowners were extracting money. So there are a whole range of things, and, and then having third-party independent monitors, and, and thank you, for Colin, for the work you do to make sure that we're all paying attention to it. But there is another piece of it, which is that we're working in places where there's been protracted conflict, extreme poverty, um, dire humanitarian needs. And one of the things that actually concerns me more is when I'm in a place where I have been to Somalia and I talk to communities and they say, I've been waiting for food for months and I still cannot get my card to work and they're not recognizing my card. And so, you know, my sister has been sharing her portions with me um, to get us through. And then you put on top of that, the very significant cuts in humanitarian assistance, not because governments are cutting, just because the crises are outnumbering the resources. And you know that at the moment, you know, WFP resources in places like Somalia are going to drop to about 60% of what they are. And you think, okay, where, where do I, how do I mitigate? My number one goal is to make sure people don't die. Right. So you have to maintain government donor support for these projects. The EU is apparently suspended funding, they claimed, according to a report in Reuters. Um, you know, I hear whispers about similar issues in Afghanistan and Yemen. Um, you know, how are you going to get a handle on this? I mean, I, I sort of feel like there, if I really, you know, if me and other reporters put enough time into this, we could spend the next six months doing similar stories in other UN duty stations. So how do, you, how do you kind of address that and also convince, you know, the people who are giving money to keep giving it? Number one is just being transparent, right? It's, it's not trying to hide um, what, what we know can often be risks, but also not trying to hide when we know things aren't going well right. and um, bringing the donor community along with us um, as we build a more transparent and effective system. Right. All right. Well, our time is up. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, Amy. It's my and pleasure. It's great Thanks to very much. Meet you in person. Take care. All right. Take care.